Good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming to my talk. My name is Joe Gattis. So, as Amy said, uh, I'm a um, digital preservation analyst at the National Library of New Zealand. I've been there for five years. Um, what I wanted to talk to you about today was um, some work that we've been doing over the past couple of years, three years, which has really got not much to do with digital preservation on the face of it, but really it's about trying to get content into the collections in a... In a um, sensible, controlled, and manageable way. So um, there's a lot of water theme in my talk. So if you haven't used the facilities, anything that might upset your sensibilities, perhaps quickly scoot off now. Um, if this works, does this thing work? Hello, where am I pointing it? Maybe just click that. There we go. So I'm going to talk to you about um, the physical workflow. So this is kind of um, what we did with content up to 2003, uh, and then I'm going to talk. I'm going to kind of talk about how that's changed as we got the um, um, the changes to the National Libraries Act in 2003. Um, talk about perhaps what an idealised workflow looks like and where we can make some savings, where we where we want to be doing things slightly differently. Um, we'll think about what that what that means, what the considerations are, and then I'll give you some examples of work that we've been doing. Um, this is a picture that I, um, I got a very dear friend of mine, um, Kate McIntyre, to draw. Um, so she drew that for me, and I kind of said, look, I want a horse um, not drinking. Um, and so she drew it for me. And, and this is kind of where I sometimes get to feeling about digital um, in the library. We all have the internet. We all have these computers and amazingly powerful machines on our desks um, that's capable of doing wonderful and great things for us. And it seems like sometimes we kind of plod through the mire and we're not kind of harnessing the power and capability that the internet and this kind of streamed resource gives us. Um, and so my kind of proposition for this talk really is, um, you know, we, we, we are at the water, you know, we have the water available to us, but can we actually drink it? And obviously the water being this digital content. So we're specifically not talking about collecting um, the web, we do web collecting, and that's slightly out of the scope of this talk. We're, collect we're talking about collecting via the web, so using the web as a medium for, for collecting content. Um, <clears throat> it was very interesting, as I was writing this talk, there was a, um, uh, um, an article, front page story in the Dominion Post, uh, Robot Workers, your colleagues in less than a decade. Uh, and, it, and it made me chuckle, because, you know, this is kind of really what we're trying to build now. They're not robots with, um, you know, heads and arms and articulated and wandering around bleeping and blooping at us. They're scripts. They're, they're um, just methods of dealing with the world in an organized way, in a controlled way, that liberates us kind of mere mortals from some of the mundanity of processing regular-shaped objects. And that's kind of really what we're talking about. So I would argue that it's way less than a decade away, and if we get it right, we could be starting, you know, we are starting to do this stuff today, really. Um, so, uh, and I apologize for those of you at the back, I'm going to talk through these steps anyway. Um, this is kind of what the physical um, paradigm looked like. So, the green is the publisher, and the blue is what happens kind of in, in the library. Um, and I've been a bit loose with terminology, and I'll explain what they mean. Up here, somebody publishes something, and then uh, under the previous obligation in the physical space, they would send it to the library. Of course, there's some very good kind of collaborative stuff, and we would, you know, there were some kind of nice arrangements, but in principle, that's kind of what we're talking about. There is a process of checking. If it's not right, then we go back to the publisher, and that's kind of a quality loop up that side. If it's okay, we bring it in, we describe it, we analyze it. Um, there is a big difference between these two, and I picked those words um, quite carefully and with lots of discussion with colleagues around the library. The describe is that really, really bland stuff. You know, it is a book, and we can tell it's a book. It's got N pages. Um, it's um, um, written by an author. All very accessible bits of metadata. The analyze is the way deeper kind of indexing the kind of conceptual stuff. It's about dreams. It's about thing, blah, 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 whatever. Um, that bit's hard. That bit's kind of easy when it gets to digital stuff. Um, we put it on a shelf, and then, ta-da, it's available, and it's in the collection. So that's kind of the traditional model. That's kind of what we've worked with, and we still work in the physical space with that model. The digital has uh, an interesting difference. The primary difference is up here. We have an obligation to kind of pull now. Instead of it being pushed to us, we have to go and collect. So instead of it being given to us, nicely packaged and, and, and by, the, by the content creator, we kind of have to go and visit them in the online space and do something meaningful with their content. That it's made available to us, which is the, I believe it's the wording in the, in, in the legislation, is, is all that we kind of have a, a mandate for. So we have to go the other way. We have to go and collect the content. We still do this quality assurance piece. We ingest it, which is the kind of nerdy way of saying, you know, receive it. We still describe it. We still analyze it. We don't need to shelve it because um, obviously the shelves that we have now are slightly different. Um, and then, of course, it's made available. So that's kind of where we are. That's what we're doing. And I guess the, my argument here is um, we could really do some magic with some of these steps and we could, we could automate some of that stuff. We don't really need to be doing it. 
We could build tools that will go and collect content for us. We can go and touch a website. We can touch an FTP. We can read RSS feeds, whatever we need to do. We can do some of that rudimentary checking. I'm expecting 10 issues. I've got 10 issues. Tick. Move on. Um, we can ingest it automatically, so we're, we're very privileged at the National Library to have the Rosetta platform. The Rosetta platform has a whole bunch of APIs under the hood, which means that we can kind of structure some content, throw some metadata around it, and disappears magically into the system, and, and kind of it feels like nobody does any work. Um, some of that description stuff can happen. Um, you know, I can, we, can, um, we can look at the metadata of a PDF file, we can pick up keywords, we can pick up um, publisher-led um, bits of data uh, that describe our content. Oh, I'm turning into a Kiwi. I said data. I've been here for five years. It's taken that long. I think that's the first time I've ever done that. Oh. Um, that analysis still has to be done in a human way because it's still hard. It's conceptually difficult. Um, perhaps in the future it might be done by these clever robots, but for now, that's perfectly okay. That's the really difficult bit. That's why we pay smart people and, and people that kind of, um, you know, have a really good feeling for this process to do that job. So let's save the difficult jobs for them and give these kind of dumb, boring, mundane jobs to, to, to scripts ostensibly. So I guess really the, the, the question here is, how do we get that magic? Like, what is that magic? What, is it, what does it do? And my argument is it's not really magic. It's just about having an organized mechanism of thinking about what do we do and how we do it. You're getting annoyed by him just yet. <laughs> He's quite captivating. Hmm. Um, um, so I'm going to give you some examples in, in a wee minute that's going to talk about how, to, how, we've kind of trying, how we're trying to tackle that. We're trying to use proof of concepts. We're trying to think about, oh, I have to move him on, um, how, we think about, um, how we think about digital and how we think about collecting um, and the building blocks that we need to kind of put together to allow us to, um, to, to kind of do this stuff in, in, in an automatic way. So we, you know, we have some basic steps. And if we think about that workflow, we have to go and visit and collect. We probably have to walk through some structures. We have to pick up these kind of binary objects. And we want to pick up metadata along the way. So if a publisher is very kindly generating um, a pre is generating keywords, is generating summary, generating author dates, why don't we just grab it at the same time? Like, why are we redoing this stuff, you know? Um, we want to package it so we can put it into our system. So, you know, if I can somehow bubble all that data into a nice structure, give it to Rosetta, and then Rosetta knows how to populate its fields. And then we also have our catalog. So again, can I package it in such a way that our catalog goes, I know exactly what you're telling me, and in we go. Um, that, that feels like the right thing to be doing. Um, and then, and there's an informed stage where, you know, we can't just fire these things off blindly. We need to know what's going on. You can't just kind of assume that it's all happening because um, if you don't do that, it suddenly stops happening and then you realize you've got a, f a backlog to address. So we need to have this mechanism in the middle that says, hey, I did a job for you. This is what I discovered. I've put it over there. If it went wrong, this is what might have gone wrong or this is where I got to. So those are the kind of the basic um, steps that we were, that we kind of got to when we were thinking about what did this magic, automagical process feel like. Um, so, this is a whiteboard. I love whiteboards. Uh, I am truly a nerd. Um, I have whiteboards in my house. Um, that's kind of how I like to think about the world. So, you know, this is a snapshot of a meeting where we sat down and we were talking about, okay, what does this process look like? What, what are the steps that we need to put in the way to um, um, give us the ability to do something in a clever way? So part of the thing for me is that, that ability to have space to work in this way. And so again, I do genuinely feel truly privileged to work at the National Library and, and be tolerated and given the space to think about some of this stuff. Um, hopefully sometimes it, it, you know, it does generate benefit. Um, we need resources. You, know, you need to have machines that can do this stuff. You can't do it with a wet piece of string. You need, you need a computer that can talk to the internet and do clever things. Um, you need supportive management. Sometimes you need some real kind of bloody mindedness. You need, it takes a while to solve some of these problems. Um, and I, I always kind of come back to one of my favorite little sayings, which is a bit dumb, um, but in a meta way it works. Um, it's quite okay to have stupid ideas, because if it works, it kind of wasn't stupid. So there's a lot of that glue in, in the things that, um, that I think we've been making. We can turn that stuff, that whiteboard stuff, into kind of formal projects. So, you know, we can, we can put the paperwork in, we can, we can give it a name, we can engage resources, we can get devs, we can engage with our IT provider, um, we can put bits of infrastructure down, um, we can make sure that we're figuring out our assumptions and make sure that we understand what they are, um, and we can also make sure we understand dependencies. Um, so for me, that's a really interesting part of this problem. If we don't frame these automated tools in the right way, um, we, we end up missing some of those dependencies. So when they go wrong, they can go wrong spectacularly because you think you're doing all this clever stuff, and in reality, nothing is happening. Um, so um, you know, those dependencies are super interesting. 
Um, and there is this trade-off for me between researching the automation versus just getting the job done. If I have 10 objects, it's probably not worth me writing a crawler to go ahead and grab those 10 objects. Um, it's probably much quicker for me just to go ahead and get those 10 objects manually. So the question for me is, where's that trade-off? How do we get a feeling and a sense for this collection is worth processing in an automatical way, and this one, just get on with it and get it done and over the line? And I think there's a, there's a, there's a nice lesson there for us. So I started to think about um, different sets and the different um, types of collections that we've been addressing. And I'm just going to skip you through some, some different classes of, 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 of collections that we've been working on. So one of them is neatly shaped sets. So what I mean by that is they are well prescribed. They have an inherent structure which is easy to access. They're very easy to consume. So you know a binary and a piece of well-structured metadata. Um, arguably, when somebody else has done the hard work for you, he says, looking in the NZ direction. So one of the uh, projects we did was to have a look at a, a DNZ title that had been digitized um, and figure out whether we could just write a very rudimentary crawler that would go and pick up the, DN the DNZ data, turn it into a um, depositable object, and then pop it into Rosetta. And it turns out pretty straightforward. So we wrote that. Um, we picked up the um, Public Service Association Journal and, and its sister title. Um, so we picked up like a thousand issues. Um, hu limited human interaction. It took you know a couple of hours to write the script and test it, and away it went. Um, about 100 gig of data, um, and it's kind of done. You know that was that was easy. That was kind of a nicely bounded uh, piece of work. The lessons for us there were one, one person's clean, clean data is another person's broken software. Um, so I make these assumptions that the date is going to appear in a certain form because I use date to generate designation and all sorts of other library stuff. Um, when we have the date is September and um, October. Um, my parser goes, I don't really know what that means because I just want September or October. So, you know, there was a very nice negotiation with DNZ and we kind of talked about how do, we, how do we make those things cleaner and we kind of clean up that conjure. So that's very cool. Um, a bit of minor tweaking and away we went. So it was really good and, and actually one of the good lessons for me was that really nice clean feedback loop. So having DNZ in the building and being able to just talk to them directly was, a, was an incredibly fruitful experience and I'm, and I'm sure there's lots more gold um, in that hill. Um, differently shaped sets. So this is kind of where we've done most of the work. We've been doing this for a wee while. And I'm just going to skip through very quickly, I think, four examples. So we worked, um, we, we did a test run at a YouTube playlist. So um, Auckland Museum have their, an audience with um, playlist set. And the question was, can we go and pick that up in a, in a smart way? And the answer is, yep, no worries. We can do that. It's easy. Um, we got 90% of their traffic. I forget the numbers, but it was a crazy amount of data. Um, and we can pick up the comments if we want it. So the structural form is different. It's not a website, but it is the data that is, that is driving the, the, the YouTube website. And that was only possible because YouTube opened their API and allow us to kind of annoy these things in, a, in, a, in, a, in a quite an automatic way. Uh, we had a, another really fascinating one with the um, NZLII, which is the Legal Gazette. Um, and again, the, the short story there is that we picked up 34 gig of data, 77,000 files, which covered off 782 titles. Um, we picked it up in about three days. There was very little human intervention once we got the thing going. Um, and we just have this nice bundle of data. There is a giant problem with that, and I will come to that at the end of this little piece. Um, we have another um, publisher, Dove Press. Again, they're responsible for about um, 130 titles. We've done them three years now. And so each year, the first year, it took about three weeks. It was the very first one we did. It took about three weeks to write the script because it was kind of like you know learning to, to walk a little bit. Um, and, and my favorite part of all of this story was when we run it last time, we just kind of went, oh, let's dust off that script, hit go. And then a day later, it finished. And it did exactly what it was supposed to do. So it was quite, quite rewarding. Um, um, and so we have some lessons. Um, the lessons are we, we obviously need to talk to content owners. You, it's kind of a bit rude to go and annoy somebody's API and kind of take all of their stuff. Um, because when things go wrong and then you phone them up and kind of go, hey, your API doesn't like me anymore. Um, I think you're blocking me. And they go, yeah, we are. What are you doing? And you go, ah, oh, I probably should have spoke to you before. Sorry. Um, but once you talk to them, it's fine. So actually, that conversation is very good and very fruitful. Um, but you, they need to kind of, you know, it's, it's a good way of having the conversation about um, requirements and legal deposit and what the National Library does and digital preservation, which is my actual job. Um, the other thing is bottleneck. So really, sometimes all we're doing is we're moving the bottleneck on. We know that the bottleneck at the moment is collecting the stuff. We've only got so many people with hands and mice and keyboards and monitors. Um, so that's kind of the bottleneck. So if we can move that downstream, the bottleneck now is, is um, some of the collecting colleagues now have big giant folders of things to think about ingesting. Um, so 
it doesn't solve much. All it does is kick the problem slightly further down the road, but that's fine because we spot the next bottleneck. We start to build um, ingest mechanisms which allow us to automate that piece, and that will move the problem onto the cataloging side, and that's somebody else's problem. And you know, the idea here is to keep trying to move the bottleneck away uh, um, and by understanding what the flow looks like. Um, and then finally, this conceptual change is really, really interesting. You know, in the traditional space, a journal is a thing and it's bound and it's pages and paper and it has a chapter and a, and a title. Um, what we're increasingly finding is journals have attendant things. So an article may have an embedded YouTube video. In our kind of logical structure of how we, how we regard intellectual entities, we start to have to wonder about how do we represent that in a sensible way? What part of the CMS record do we attach things to? Who owns the IP of these things? Um, if we can't successfully pick up um, something because of DRM problems, does that mean that the article is incomplete or is it a, an attendant piece of the, of the um, object that is incomplete? So there's some interesting kind of questions that that raises for us. And again, I don't think it's a problem. I think it's a genuinely good thing. Um, so that was kind of discrete sets which are bound and they're fixed and they're fixed in time. Um, the next thing that we're interested in is, is stuff which is streamed, so that constant, constant drip of content. So the very first one we did was we worked very closely with um, um, part of our, our DI agency is the, is, the, is the GIS, who are again co-sited in our building, and we did this fantastic project with them where they changed their publishing, publishing paradigm for the Gazette. So the Gazette is a legal instrument, they publish it every day, notices. Um, it's every day there's between one and 100 notices. They, they have about 8,000 notices a year, um, and it's kind of part of the, the formal construct of the government. Of, of New Zealand. Um, they've completely changed their paradigm, um, so they're going away from print. They don't want to do print anymore. They want to just do digital. And that causes us some interesting questions around what do we do with legal deposit, because we need to be able to collect it. We need to let them fulfill their legal deposit mandate, but we don't want to be a giant burden. We don't want to kind of cause a problem. So we sat down in a room, and we just kind of nutted it out, and it was awesome. We sat down and, and looked at their API. Um, it turns out they've done some really, really cool things. It was very easy for us to write a, a, a crawler. So we just fire a crawler once a day. It picks up everything they published yesterday. It packages it nicely, in theory, and deposits it into um, Rosetta. Um, so all of that kind of works, apart from the bit that doesn't work but that's dirty laundry and I should probably leave that over there. Um, but in theory, it's a beautiful and wonderful thing. Um, there are some things we need to kind of get over. Um, we find that the technology infrastructure is probably where we have the most um, problems. Um, as you start to do weird and wonderful things, the corporate space doesn't tend to like what you're doing. Um, but it was great. We influenced the API. They're very happy. They're, they're very interested in that ability to get their legal deposit mandate, and they get a record. So my script emails them every time and says, hey, we collected your stuff. This is what we've got. And they can go, great, we're comfortable that our content has gone into the library, and um, that's all we need to worry about. So it's a, it's, it's a nice kind of closed loop. This one is the biggie. This one really, for me, is, 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 is genuinely a very, very exciting opportunity. And so what we're doing in this one, which is a big scaled set, is working with um, Fairfax Media and working with their content. And so we're dealing with 81 titles. We, um, through some very, very complex, long and, and fruitful negotiations and conversations over the years, um, um, we have um, established ourselves inside their print pipeline. So we have a, a, an FTP server, which is part of their publish Thank you. Part of their publish um, routine, they um, hit go, they send their pages to the printers, and at the same time, I get a copy on the FTP. We then just build a bunch of scripts around that, which collects the issues, builds the things, um, and so we can just pick up yesterday's newspapers. We can package them, and we can get them into Rosetta, um, you know, again, relatively automatedly. There is, there is very little work that needs to go on. There, it's a pilot scheme, so we're just kind of figuring out what that means, and there's some quite challenging intellectual questions around the, the cataloging and indexing space that this kind of opens up, which is fabulous. I think it's a very, very good thing. So, you know, we, um, in the six weeks trial that we ran, we picked up um, 12,000 issues, uh, uh, sorry, 1,200 issues and, and supplements. It was about 31,000 files and it was about 50 gig of data. Um, that's kind of constant, you know, that, that's all day, every day. So if we get that bit right, we're kind of doing something right. We've kind of managed to do a bit of work up front that means that we can smooth some of the pain and burden. And, and again, I watch every, every day pretty much my colleagues um, over in that um, collections team opening the big boxes and getting all the newspapers out from yesterday and dealing with them and putting them in, in the kind of the nice piles and we do the cataloging and we do the microfishing. And I'm not suggesting that we're going to replace that immediately. I'm suggesting that there are alternate ways of collecting the same data um, and eventually we will tip over. You know, eventually consumption will be digital. You know, so if we don't kind of start thinking about it now, we're only going to have to think about it tomorrow. 
this is where I want to be. This is kind of in my head. This is my little mini mission, is, is getting us to a place where we are serenely, calmly, uncomplicatedly consuming this content. It's part of our every day to day. We have mechanisms in place. We have tools in place. Um, and it's, and, it's, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a part of our standard business. We're comfortable with building these robots and these automated things that will do that churn for us. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the hard bit we leave to the humans because kind of, you know, we've got the smart brains. We can do the, the actual clever thinking. Um, what we want to do is do that in a common direction with content producers and other people and other projects. So, you know, part of my reason for standing here is to kind of convince you that this is a viable way of collecting. And if you're if you're responsible for collecting things, I think there's some there's some really really nice stuff in the heart of all of that, um, which is which is going to make some genuine person savings. So that was my talk. Thank you very much for being very patient and listening. Um, any questions? No, that's good. Oh no, there's a question. as you're shifting the automated bottlenecks, that's where it's going to end up. Yeah. And we know about machine analytics mm -hmm. and the analytical power of what can be done. Um, does that mean that the human dimension might, in, in future in your dream, be more of a buffer area for editing or verification than actually manually doing the analysis component? Um, I, I think that's an excellent question. I, um, if I take off my, I am a National Library employee and probably have a, he says, looking a bill without looking a bill. Um, personally, I think that's absolutely right. You know, I think, I think the scale at which we're creating content, we, we, we won't be able to keep up with the analysis properly. So we have to put these mechanisms in place. And so actually Douglas's talk will probably talk about some mechanisms um, that, that kind of give us insight into that was a nice kind of segue through. Um, but I think, I think it's the answer. You know, otherwise we die. You know, I, I think we simply, we simply have a problem of, of volume and scale if we, don't, if we don't start to automate and put some shims in the way. Any other questions? Awesome. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to hand back over to Amy. So thank you very much for your time.